Okay, so we have here uh, our graph showing as you increase substrate concentration, as you know now, as you increase the concentration, you increase the rate up to a point and then it levels off because it doesn't matter how much more substrate you add, you've run out of active sites. Now, the thing with competitive inhibitors is that because they're competing directly for the active site, they're not changing its shape or anything like that, as you increase substrate concentration, the substrate this time can actually outcompete the competitive inhibitor. So the inhibitor will no longer be able to occupy the active site if there's enough substrate around to make those enzyme substrate complexes. So as I said, once the inhibitor is bound onto the active site, it can it can be moved away again if you increase the substrate concentration. So eventually, as you can see, you do actually reach the same maximum rate of reaction if you've got a competitive inhibitor. Okay, if, if you have enough sub substrate around, you can make more enzyme substrate complexes than enzyme inhibitor complexes. So the inhibitor can't turn into any product, so it, it just collides with the active site and it just then bounces back out again, so those sites are not permanently occupied by the inhibitor. So if you have more substrate, you can have more enzyme substrate complexes. Now, at the lower end, of course, uh, the opposite is true. And so obviously at low substrate concentrations, with a set amount of inhibitor, you can have more enzyme inhibitor complexes than you are enzyme substrate complexes, and therefore you're going to have a lower rate. But as you can clearly see from the graph, as you increase that substrate concentration, you eventually will reach the maximum possible rate of reaction for that concentration of enzyme. Remember, obviously, what we've learned on the previous slides about the effects of, of enzyme and substrate concentration. So maximum rate is still maximum rate is still reached. And that's an absolute classic way of recognizing if you were given a graph in an exam question, a classic way of recognizing what type of inhibitor you're dealing with. If, if it can reach its maximum possible rate that you would see without the presence of an inhibitor, then you know it must, it must be a competitive inhibitor that you're dealing with. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about non-competitive inhibitors. And these are quite special in that basically they have the ability to bind an enzyme at a site other than the active site. We call this a, a binding site, or you might see it called an al allosteric site um, and basically these inhibitors when they bind into that site they can change the shape of the active site okay and that effectively means that they have they have denatured the enzyme okay obviously if they change the shape of the active site the substrate molecule drawn here in blue which as you can see at the moment would be complementary would fit the active site if that non-competitive inhibitor binds the binding site elsewhere other than the active site. Then you can see we've got this change of shape of the active site and then the substrate will no longer fit. Just like we see when we um, denature enzymes with pH and temperature. I realise my drawing's not amazing but uh, hopefully you get the idea. Okay, so it doesn't fit anymore, it is no longer complementary. Okay, the active site has changed its shape, the substrate no longer fits. And non-competitive inhibitors are quite sneaky because basically when they when they are added to a reaction, basically shall I make this clear? So this is our this is our substrate concentration graph again. Sorry about the rubbish writing. Oh sorry, mate. Okay, but actually you can see that in the presence of the non-competitive inhibitor, actually the maximum rate of reaction is never reached because it's effectively denatured the enzyme. So it doesn't matter how much more substrate you add, it's never going to reach its maximum potential because the active sites have effectively been removed. So again, this is a really... Um, quick and easy way of having a look at to see whether or not if you're given a graph in an exam how can you tell that the reaction has been affected by either a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor well as you can see the non-competitives never never reach their maximum 
was, if you remember from the previous slide, the competitive inhibitors eventually will be outcompeted by the substrate and therefore it will eventually reach its maximum. Now it's really important to remember, also I was talking about um, the enzyme being effectively denatured, just trying to get you to understand the consequences really of the active site. But it's important to know that actually that they are not necessarily denaturing the enzyme. Some sometimes the binding to this binding site is irreversible. So in that case, I guess you could argue it is has been denatured because once an enzyme is denatured, it can no longer work. And quite a lot of your poisons, things like venoms and stuff in snakes and spiders, they will act like that. They bind irreversibly and therefore the consequences are, effectively, that the enzyme is denatured. However, there are examples, and I'll talk to you more about this on the next slide, where, um, and this is very common actually in, in biochemistry and in, in cell biology, where we have basically molecules called regulators which um, can act on enzymes and basically control whether or not they work or not. And I'm sure you can imagine um, sort of keeping the chemical reactions of the body at exactly sort of the right rate, depending on the amount of substrate products you either have available or need to make, that actually that is a really important regulatory process. So it's really important to remember, I'll just say that again, that, that non-competitive inhibitors do not do not necessarily and quite often don't actually denature that enzyme once it's moved away from its binding site the enzyme will become functional again okay as i said i thought you'll see an example of something similar to that on the next slide okay so it's always good to sort of have a, an example in your mind about what what inhibitors might be actually doing in, in biology and we've got here quite a difficult application question that that came up a few years back on one of our papers as you can see we've got an example here of a um of an enzyme, okay, and it exists in its non-functional form. Okay, and basically what happens is a substance can actually bind elsewhere on the um, enzyme and cause the active site to change shape to actually become complementary, complementary to that substrate. So now it's basically been activated. And what can happen is in things like cancer, for example, um, enzymes can due to mutations, can become faulty. Okay, what happen what's happened over here on the right-hand side, if you can see, is that we've got this, this binding site basically has changed shape. So we're no longer able to activate the enzyme anymore. Okay, so the little activating substance, in this case actually a phosphate group, isn't able to do its job because the binding site's changed shape. Consequently, the active site is always going to fit the substrate. Now, what scientists have done is they've designed a drug um, which basically acts like a non-competitive inhibitor to this new mutated binding site. And the consequence of that is when it binds on there, it, like non-competitive inhibitors do, changes the shape of the active site and effectively turns that enzyme back into its non-functional form. Okay, and so therefore, obviously the cell's lost its control. It's not able to to turn this enzyme on and off anymore and therefore it's better for the patient other than the, obviously they're, if they've got cancer to actually just, just wipe out this enzyme totally and put it back into its non-functional form. Okay, so that was quite a difficult application question because it came in lots of different parts and um, really it's only this last bit here which is the non-competitive inhibitor bit, okay. The first part was also part of the question and it... Uh, that confused quite a lot of people. Nationally, the question wasn't answered well, um, even though, uh, as the same as at this, this particular centre, but students just obviously didn't quite realise this idea of, of activate, the enzymes can be activated or regulated in vivo, in, in, in living tissue. Um, and they sort of got confused and thought that first part was about the inhibitor and the and the changing the shape of the active site, but actually it was the last bit. So just watch out for these types of questions. You've got to use the information provided. Think about what you already know about inhibitors and how they work. If you ever see a, a, any question where the, the active site has changed shape, 
clearly you've got to be thinking non-competitive inhibitor somewhere but often there might be extra bits of info now i'm going to go on on the next slide just to have a little a little chat with you about this idea of regulation and how in the, under normal circumstances not not just in cancer in this case but under, under normal circumstances that the enzymes of our body are quite tightly regulated um and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about on, on the next slide about exactly sort of how that happens. Okay, so this is a really good way of looking at how inhibitors can actually act as regulators sort of in, in, in cell biology. Um, so we have a metabolic pathways, which are quite a, a precise sequence of enzyme-controlled chemical reactions that happen in the cytoplasm or the stroma of a chloroplast or the matrix of a mitochondria and so on. And basically what we have is the need for the human body to keep relatively constant levels of conditions within it and that will include the amount of product it's making and slash the amount of substrate it's using up. So, so what happens is they use something called a negative feedback loop to basically enable them to control the amount of product that they make and as you can see here in this example and this is quite nicely illustrated further on page 37 of the old book is that the final product of this particular metabolic pathway um, is actually able to inhibit enzyme number one, or the first enzyme in the chain. And I'll see this particular one to make it easy and simple. I've just got one intermediate stage, but in all honesty, once you sort of look at the more complex biochemical pathways that we'll study later on in A2, so um, respiration, photosynthesis, I mean, they're very, they can be really quite complex um, sequences of enzyme catalyzed reactions. It could be quite long. Respiration could involve, you know, could involve 30, 40 enzymes. So I've just made this simple, but actually, it, as I said, it could look a lot longer than that. And But it makes sense, I guess, for you to inhibit the first enzyme in that sequence. And that's quite often what you see, but not necessarily. So in this case, we've got our product, which, you know, could whatever the end product is. And that end product, when it gets too high, will generally inhibit chemical reactions by non-competitive inhibition. Okay, this type of, of inhibition is called end product inhibition for obvious reasons. And as I said, it, it generally is a non-competitive one. So we're talking about these products, the products of a sequence of events, the end product, binding a site other than the active site, changing the shape of the active site, and therefore that substrate will no longer fit it's so all the usual marking points if you've got an exam question on this. So obviously if it will no longer fit, then you're going to get fewer enzyme substrate complexes and therefore the rate of, <coughs> excuse me, the rate of reaction will go down. Now clearly as time goes on, of course the end product now is going to reduce an amount. Okay, And as it's reduced, because enzyme 1 in, in the chain has been inhibited, as that amount of product reduces, it's no longer able to act as a non-competitive inhibitor. And of course, therefore, this negative feedback loop will stop and enzyme 1 will no longer be inhibited. Consequence of this, of course, is that the product can now increase again in amount and therefore will then eventually get too high again, in which case it will then act as a non-competitive inhibitor back on enzyme 1 and so on. And as you can see, over time, you get this almost figure of 8, sort of every time it goes above what it should, it will inhibit the enzyme until eventually it drops below where it should be, and then the inhibition will stop, and then it will get back to normal, but go above again, and so on and so forth. So you get this sort of, um, sort of effect where... Desirable levels would be the straight line in the middle. Oh, I'm slightly wrong there. You get the idea. So when you actually put that on a graph, you can see that obviously we've got the amount of product up there on the uh, on the left and time and on the bottom. And wherever the amount of product gets too high, so above that normal midline, that's in these places, that's where the product would be inhibiting the enzyme. And wherever it drops as a consequence of this inhibition the levels drop below the line from there as well obviously that is where um the inhibition would stop and the enzyme would would um, be working again and as you can see that just each time it's inhibited the product goes down and therefore the inhibition will stop so the product goes up and so on okay